This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a woman asking a sales assistant about insurance policies. Before you listen again, you have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 6. Good morning. Take a seat. I see you've picked up some of our brochures. Yes, I've been reading the one on travel. Would the travel insurance be for you or for your family as well? Just for me. So, individual? That's right. Are you looking for a basic or a comprehensive policy? To be honest, I've had basic in the past, but it didn't pay out very much. That's often true. With our company, you can be insured for different amounts. For instance, in Section 1, Baggage and Personal Effects, you can be insured for all five subsections or for as few as two. I think I'd like insurance for all five since I'm going to some unsafe places. Wise decision. By the way, can a camera be counted as a single item or must it be included in cameras and portable electronic equipment? If you have an expensive camera, you can nominate it as a single item. Our maximum payout is $1,500. Occasionally, people have their camera and computer stolen together. If insurance is only taken out on subsection 2, this may not cover the replacement of both things. That's what happened with my previous policy. However, in that one, there was a higher limit for lost or stolen money. Yours is only $700. These days, with credit cards, people don't carry much cash, so we've set the limit accordingly. Still, we pay out well for documents. Indeed. In the disrupted travel section, reasonable costs is written for a missed connection or an early return instead of an amount of money. What exactly are reasonable costs? Put it this way. If you miss your flight due to poor weather that is verifiable, we pay $300 per day of lost time. If you arrive at check-in as the aircraft is leaving because you overslept, we still pay out, but only $100 a day. We rely on information from the airline to determine this. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 7 to 10. Are you also interested in vehicle insurance? Yes, I am. I'm about to buy a nice old car, a vintage Jaguar XJ6. Hey, I used to have one of those, although nowadays I prefer old motorbikes. Did you know you can insure a vehicle on its own, or you can include it in our multi-saver policy, along with your house and contents? Yes, I saw that. It's true I'm buying an expensive car, but I rent my house, so I'm not ready for a multi-saver. I understand. Have you decided which level of cover you'd like for your car? Top cover. Are you sure? It is pricey. I know. 
But last time I had insurance, I wasn't covered for storm damage. Don't tell me that was just before the November hailstorm. Uh-huh. So I need storm damage insurance. Also, I'd like my policy to start as soon as I've paid for it. With my old one, there was a stand-down period of two weeks. Would you believe I backed into a wall just three days after I'd taken out the policy? Oh, dear. Then I spent months fighting with the insurance company over the value of my car. I know it wasn't worth much, but it was relatively new. If you choose top cover, we agree on a value for your car and renegotiate each year to avoid disputes. Again, it's not as cheap as some, but the policy works out better in the long run. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 Touring Devonport on a Segway You will hear a guide giving information on how to ride a Segway and on places to see in Devonport. Before you listen, you have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 16. Hi folks. Before we start, I'd like to check if there's anyone here under the age of 13. No? Anyone who's pregnant or who's just had leg surgery? Good. Our company isn't insured for these users. Now, I can see you're all eyeing your segways with interest. They're curious beasts, aren't they? Battery-driven two-wheeled vehicles often used in crowd control or postal delivery. I'll be giving detailed operating instructions in a moment, and then I'll outline our route. In two and a half hours, we won't see everything in Devonport, but we'll take in much more than if we were on foot. In fact, the maximum speed of a Segway is 18 kilometres per hour. Righto. Safety gear. Here are your helmets. Please keep them on while riding. I hope you're wearing flat enclosed shoes as well. Actually... You can operate a Segway in any footwear, but our company insists on sturdy shoes because we explore tunnels and walk around rocks at North Head. So, riding a Segway is marvellously easy once you know how. It's important not to think of a Segway as similar to a bicycle or a scooter, since a Segway rider barely needs to exert energy to move. This concept of movement with minimal exertion seems foreign to some beginners, and most mishaps are the result of riders jerking backwards and losing their balance. Another mistake learners make is to hop off a Segway when they've stopped. But a Segway is as steady when stationary as when in motion. So don't dismount unless there's a place you can't ride into, like the tunnels in North Head or the French Café, where we end our tour. A Segway is also robust. It's quite light at 36 kilograms, and its low centre of gravity and wide tyres mean it can handle many different surfaces. In fact, I've been in the snow with mine. However, a Segway does have a delicate internal mechanism, 
It contains a gyroscope, a device that's constantly moving to keep itself and you upright. OK. Using the controls. The first thing you'll notice is that there are hardly any. There's an on-off button and a screen indicating battery life and operational mode. We'll be using normal. So, let's turn on our segways. Now, hold the post upright and place one foot on the platform. Push the on-off button. You'll see the red lights rotating while the gyroscope is calibrating. When the lights turn green, release the kickstand and place both feet on the platform. Now, lean forward slowly and the machine will start. Lean further forward and it will speed up. In fact, leaning is the way to control your Segway. Leaning, remember, not jerking. That'll make you fall off. Lean backwards and the Segway slows down. Keep leaning backwards and it stops. Twist the left handle to go left. Twist the right to go right. Simple. With the internal gyroscope constantly monitoring your centre of gravity and adjusting the post accordingly, you'll always keep your balance. Before you listen to the rest of the talk, you have 30 seconds to read questions 17 to 20. As I said earlier, we're in this lovely harbour suburb of Devonport for two and a half hours, beginning at the wharf and ending up at the French Café. On the way, we'll pass a yacht club, quite a famous club in fact, and a church and graveyard that are the oldest in this part of the city. We'll also climb two volcanoes. The first volcano has remains from pre-European settlement in the form of storage pits and terraces, but there are no buildings left. The second volcano, called North Head, has a museum at its base and some disused tunnels. The museum is devoted to naval history, but I'm afraid we won't have time to visit. Where do we go next? Oh yes, the rocks below North Head. The rocks below North Head lead to Cheltenham Beach. We'll leave our segways above the rocks while we explore. It's too cold to swim at this time of year, but people do in summer. Throughout our tour, I'll be guiding you on your Segway adventure and recounting some amazing tales of this historic suburb. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 Study Options You will hear a professor talking to her student about his study options. Before you listen, you have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 24. Come in, Rangi. Thank you, Professor Anderson. I've been meaning to contact you, but I just got back last night. Where have you been? Conferences in Massachusetts and New York. For physics? Yes. Great. I'm looking forward to attending conferences one day. I imagine that won't be so far away. I was extremely impressed with your classical mechanics exam. In fact, you were one of only two students out of 180 to get an A+. Wow. 
I really did enjoy the course. So how can I help you? I'm sorry to say it's a bit of a long story. You see, I've had to rethink my studies completely, and I wonder if I'm making the right decision. You're doing two degrees, aren't you? Science and arts. I was doing two. I've decided to focus on science. Oh? It all came about because I wanted to study abroad for a year. I was thinking about Edinburgh. Firstly, I sought approval from the maths and physics departments. I wanted to take quantum mechanics and computer simulations at Edinburgh. Those are third-year courses, right? Yeah. So I received approval from maths and physics. The stumbling block was the higher authority, the science faculty. When I submitted my application, it was rejected. What? It turns out that students who study abroad for a year can only do first or second year courses or third year courses in a subject that's not their major. I've never heard that before. Needless to say, the lecturers who approved my transfer hadn't either, and nor does the regulation appear on the science faculty website. That'd be right. This faculty is disorganised. So then I thought I'd take arts courses at Edinburgh and leave the third year maths until I came back. I quickly got approval for second year history and philosophy from the arts faculty. When are you heading off? That's just it. During this process, I began to think carefully about my studies. To be honest, the arts courses I've done were less challenging than the science ones, so I've decided to drop arts. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have thirty seconds to read questions twenty-five to thirty. Where do I figure in all this? The first week after I'd made my decision, I felt fine. Without doing the arts courses, I could finish my science degree earlier. But this week, I've had some doubts. When I started the two degrees, lecturers in the science faculty assured me that these days scientists need a rounded education, which they get if they take some arts courses. I was even told I'd learn to write and think better if I did philosophy. I do think the claims made by some lecturers are dubious. Then there's the fact that now I'm going to be stuck here next year. I was so excited about going to Europe. It is disappointing to give that up. Still, the reason I wanted to contact you, Rangi, is that I'm looking for students to work six hours a week in my lab. It's paid work, not highly paid, but probably better than working in a bar. Also, we've just bought a new laser, which you'd learn to use. That sounds excellent. As to going abroad, why not do your postgraduate studies in the U.S.? There's some amazing physics being done in Massachusetts. If you like, I can send you the papers from the conference. Thanks. Of course, I'd be sad to lose you if you did go abroad, but an A plus student like you has a very good chance of winning a major scholarship. Goodness, I've never even considered that. Personally, I think committing yourself to science is the way to go. Thanks, Professor Anderson. You've taken a load off my mind. Now I don't have to deal with Hegel or Leibniz. I've plenty of time to read those conference papers. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 The Ugly Fruit Movement You will hear a lecture on the Ugly Fruit Movement as an effort to prevent food wastage. Before you listen, you have 45 seconds to read questions 31 to 40.
Good afternoon. I was in such a hurry I didn't have breakfast. I'd like to show you these apples that my neighbor grew. This one's fine, but this one's an odd shape. You certainly wouldn't find it on sale at a supermarket in this country, but it tastes great. Today, I'd like to discuss food wastage and a movement attempting to address the issue. There are ugly fruit exponents throughout Europe, but I'll focus on a group in Portugal called Fruta Feia, which means ugly fruit. But first, some statistics. According to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, or the FAO, around 40% of food for human consumption is wasted globally. The direct economic impact of this is a loss of $750 billion each year. Meanwhile, every day, 870 million people worldwide go hungry. The environmental effects of food production are also astounding. In the U.S., it's estimated that the transportation of food uses 10% of the total U.S. energy budget. At the same time, food production consumes 50% of our land and 80% of our available fresh water. The single largest component of solid municipal waste, around 40%, is rotting food, and the gases that produces increase global warming. Surprisingly, food wastage in developing countries is as high as in developed ones. What differs is where the wastage occurs. In a country like Bolivia, Laos, or Zambia, food loss occurs after harvesting and during processing due to inadequate storage, poor transportation infrastructure, and warm climatic conditions. Whereas in the developed world, wastage occurs at the retail and consumer level. Consumers seldom plan their shopping, which leads to overpurchasing, or the enormous variety of supermarket food encourages impulse buying. Furthermore, consumers are strongly advised by regulatory authorities to dispose of food that may well be edible, but which has passed its use-by date. This overly cautious labeling with use-by dates is something Fruta Fea has campaigned against. The complex food rules of the European Union began in 1992 and have fueled great discontent, especially in the UK, where journalists famously lampooned bureaucrats for banning bent bananas and curved cucumbers. After such criticism, the EU did reduce its list of rules for selling fruit and vegetables from 36 to 10. The difficulty lies with retailers that reject large amounts of food due to aesthetic considerations, believing spinach has to be completely green and tomatoes perfectly spherical. Any blemish, even one that doesn't affect the edible contents, signals an item's destruction. To reduce food wastage, the FAO recommends three things. Priority should be given to preventing wastage in the first place by balancing production with demand. Where there is surplus, Reuse by donation to needy people or to farm animals should take place. Lastly, if reuse is impossible, recycling and recovery should be pursued. Back to Portugal and Frutifea. Portugal in Western Europe is a developed nation of 10.5 million people. It joined the EU 30 years ago. In 2011, however, it was severely affected by a debt crisis, and its economy is still shaky. As a result of the debt crisis, unemployment is high and hundreds of thousands of people have left the country. In these hard times, many Portuguese are hunting for bargains. So enter the cooperative Fruta Feia, set up in Lisbon in 2013 by Isabel Suarez. Fruta Feia has three aims. To feed people cheaply, to encourage EU rulemakers to overhaul use-by dates, and to subvert notions of both what is visually acceptable and what is edible. When surveyed, most people who join Fruta Feia also support local agriculture. Isabel Suarez estimates that one-third of Portugal's farm produce is thrown out due to artificial standards set by supermarkets. A farmer, Jose Diaz, who supplies Fruta Feia, said that from his annual production of tomatoes, one quarter did not meet supermarket standards, so were dumped. Now, Fruit de Fea buys his reject tomatoes at half the price he would sell them to a supermarket. 
Consequently, Fruta Fea's members also pay less for tomatoes than supermarket shoppers do. As to the myriad of regulations set by the EU, Fruta Fea does not contravene any. Its own produce is unlabeled and unpackaged. Despite this somewhat unglamorous look, it has sold more than 20 metric tons of food in Lisbon alone. Personally, even while the contribution of Fruta Fea and its 1,000 members is tiny, they are still, literally and metaphorically, eating away at the mountains of food that otherwise go to waste. And I salute that. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.